voltage in time and in frequency as well. So this is an op-amp. We also did the MOSFET. And again, MOSFET is a much more complicated equivalent circuit. But again, it does use a voltage control current source that we came up with an updating equation for it. And here is an example of a circuit. And you can, again, you see a very good comparison between B spice and finite difference in the mean. Uh, BGT is another example. And for this one, we needed a current control current source. And here is one example. And you can see the amplification is happening over this frequency band. Uh, so those three different types of amplifier are being simulated and tested directly in the finite difference sign domain. Right now, we are trying to come up with um, S parameter and what we call it X parameter as well. S parameter is going to capture the fundamental frequency operation of this amplifier. The X parameter is going to capture the fundamental plus the harmonic, and we can integrate those into the finite difference line domain uh, code as well. OK, um, to speed up the finite difference calculation, we also uh, can use non-uniform discretization or non-uniform grid. For example, for a configuration like this, to get accurate results, you have to go to this fine mesh. But you can get the same result by having finer mesh here and finer mesh here. and the number of cells in this configuration is much smaller than the number of cells in this configuration, and we can get the same results. The way we do it is basically, <coughs> uh, if this is a fine uniform subgrid, and this is a coarse uniform subgrid, we have a transition period in which the grid is basically gradually go from the small grid to the large grid to avoid any internal numerical reflection. Uh, here is one example. You can see the circled area is having fine grid. Um, all other area is uh, coarser grid. And you can see the non-uniform grid, which is the blue, with the very fine grid is a black, almost on top of each other. And if you use a coarse grid, you are going to have a shift in frequency in this simple configuration. And you can see that the non-uniform grid in terms of simulation time, about 20, I think this, yeah, 20 minutes. If you use fine grid, it's 33 minutes. If you use uh, coarse grid, it's 10 minutes. But the coarse grid is not going to give you accurate results. So basically, from 33 to 19 minutes, that's a good saving in time. And you can also see that if you do a coarse grid, you have about 277 million cells and in the uh, non-uniform is about 181 million cells. So with space, uh, you basically save memory and, and get your simulation in a shorter period of time if you use non-uniform discretization. Uh, another example here, where we have a fine grid around this area here, and this area here, and everywhere is coarse grid. The saving in time goes from 1,800 minutes all the way to 460. And the space goes from 720 to 228. Uh, and you get basically the same result. Um, <coughs> some of the medical applications require the simulation of human tissues. And human tissues are dispersive material. Uh, basically, the frequency properties are not constant across the frequency. And we, if you try to put this into a finite difference line domain simulation, you need to take care of this property in the simulation. So we represent the permittivity, which is a function of frequency, with this expression here. And this is an example of uh, uh, which example is this? It is just one example of dispersive material. You can see that the real part changing as a function of frequency, and the imaginary part also changes as a function of frequency. So if this represents the complex uh, permittivity of the material as a function of frequency. We can adapt the finite difference line domain to use this kind of equation for the permittivity. And this way, we can integrate the dispersive material into a finite difference line domain code. We did this on a canonical problem like a sphere. And we run the finite difference line domain 
And with one run, we obtained the uh, result at three different frequencies, and we ran the dis exact solution at those three different frequencies with the three different permittivity profile, and you can see a perfect match in for the RCS in two different plane cuts. Um, some time ago, yeah, uh, 2001, about 21 years ago, we developed the expression for permittivity of different kinds of human tissues all the way to 20 gigahertz. So basically, if you would like to simulate any one of those tissues into a finite different sound domain using this Dubai expression, the table gives you the coefficients that you use it here and you integrate it into the finite different sound domain. Right now, with all the 5G applications, we have antennas that are in the 20 to 30 gigahertz and antennas in the 40, 48 gigahertz. So this table is no longer valid for those frequency ranges, so we extended those, this table all the way to 100 gigahertz. And we have an ACES paper that has the tables and the information about the, the bike coefficients all the way to 100 gigahertz. Um, I'm going to skip this because this is the topic of the next talk. And we are going to go through this in details later on. Uh, also this one. Um, of course, finite different sign domain provide all kinds of capabilities in terms of visualization. This is a very simple program at the very end of the first chapter in the book where we have a pulse in the middle here, propagating on both sides, perfect electric conductor. After a few time steps, you can see that the electric and magnetic field are displayed here. The magnetic field is multiplied by the free space and turning sync impedance to fit within the same range of the electric field. Uh, when the pulse started to hit the electric uh, conductors at the edges, you can easily see that the electric field is going to reflect with a reflection coefficient equal minus one. Magnetic field is going to reflect with a reflection coefficient equal to one, and basically continues. It's very simple, one-dimensional code that illustrates the performance. And there should be a movie here. I don't know if it's going to work or not. From the flash drive, let's see. You can see the E and H field component, how they interact with each other and, and basically interact with the perfect liquid conductor. It was a very simple code, uh, not very long, and everyone can download it and, and run it as well. Uh, all kind of simulation capabilities with the finite different sign domain. This is, for example, the electric slab, plane wave propagating through the slab, middle of the slab at the end of the slab. Um, this is two-dimension simulation for a line source illuminating a, a square cylinder. And this is basically the time domain <coughs> simulation. And once the simulation is done, you can, before you run the simulation, you can determine what frequencies, uh, what is the field distribution in the near field at different frequency. You can set up all those frequencies. Once the time domain is done, then you can see figures like this. Well, let me see if the <coughs> time domain simulation is going to work. This is a line source propagating cylindrical wave hitting the square cylinder. And you can see the field goes to the edges and being absorbed by uh, CBML. Uh, whenever the simulation is finished, uh, basically, we want it output at 1 gigahertz and 4 gigahertz, and that's basically what we get. <coughs> Again, we don't do fast Fourier transform after the time domain is finished. We do the discrete Fourier transform while the time domain is running. And we, <coughs> we do this at every node around the object in this uh, frame where we would like to see the field distribution. Um, okay, so this is a simulation one more time. Uh, 
the previous simulation was a perfect electric conductor. In this simulation, we have a, a circular dielectric cylinder. And if we run the simulation, you can see that the field goes into the cylinder, <coughs> oscillates through the cylinder, and additional field components are going to be generated when it's done. Basically, you can see, again, the field distribution inside the cylinder and outside the cylinder at different frequency component. Uh, you can also do the animation for three-dimensional object. This is the dielectric sphere and the plane wave going from this direction. And at different time step, you can see the field distribution. And in this case, we have a line source and a dielectric cylinder. Uh, it is basically animation similar to what I showed you before. But the things that we have here is that the calculation are being done on the GPU. And the animation on the screen is basically done with the same card, which is the GPU. If we run this on the CPU, that would be our performance. If we run it on the GPU, that's basically our performance. So 900 million cells per second execution for a two-dimensional problem on a GPU that's basically doing the calculation and visualization as well. Uh, we can accelerate the finite difference on domain uh, using C and CUDA and run it on a GPU. If we don't have a GPU, then basically we use a Fortran code with executable to run it on the CPU. Uh, this is basically some of the features in our code and some of the objects that we pre-built object that you can build complicated object out of them. Uh, all these circuit elements are integrated into it. Here is one example of, uh, this example was done many, many years ago. It took about 0.7 minutes on, if you remember GTX 480, that's more than 12 years old graphic card. Uh, but the execution performance here is about 750 million cells per second execution. Um, this is another EBG structure. Um, you see this is the same loop here. And then you don't see any good operating frequency here. When you put an EBG structure under it, and we, we now we have a very wide capability in this frequency range. But this computational domain, number of time steps is the same, number of cells is the same. You see this here has 2.5 million cells, 12,000 time step. This is still 2.5 million cells, 12,000 time step. This simulation took the same amount of uh, minutes, less than one minute to be executed. If you try to do this using finite element, you really have to mesh every gap on every EBG structure here. And I'm, I am sure that the simulation uh, using finite element in this configuration, in this configuration would be tremendously different than each other. In the finite difference sign domain, we don't have any difference at all. And we're predicting the performance. Um, I may have shown you this circular polarized antenna in the previous presentation, and it's being done also with the finite difference on the design, where we have fine grid here around the areas where we have traces and coarse grid everywhere else. And this is how we set up the region that has finer grid relative to coarse grid, um, and basically uh, results in comparison with each of these results and comparison with measurement as well. Uh, another type of antenna <coughs> using coplanar waveguide structure. Uh, Vivaldi antenna is a very wide band antenna. And you can see one element here, radiation pattern, and also the performance as a function uh, input reflection coefficient. And you can see the radiation pattern. And you can see the band that of operation that's about 5.5 all the way to 10 gigahertz operating for this wideband antenna. Um, we also created the world polarized uh, Vivaldi antenna. The feeding structure is what you see it here. And these images are coming directly from the simulator. And you can see the wideband characteristic except for maybe those glitches here that basically this is all under 10 gigahertz, uh, under minus 10 dB. 
radiation pattern for this configuration. And here I'm showing you a very simplified dipole antenna. And the reason for this, and I predicted the uh, pattern that we would predict from a dipole antenna. But the capabilities that we have right now is that with a simple uh, editing command, we can extend this dipole antenna into antenna arrays. We can do the same thing with any kind of antenna. You can have, you can build one antenna and you extend it to arrays. And basically, you can see the same S22, for example, operating at the same frequency. You can also uh, look at the coupling. And this coupling is about minus 25 dB coupling across very wide bandwidths between the elements. And the nice feature here is that you can do phase <coughs> uh, phase the antenna system. You can define the amplitude and phase for each element and predict the far field. You don't really need to rerun the time domain. You just run the time domain one time and post-processing you can assign the amplitude and phase for the each element to uh, provide beam scanning capability. For example, for broad side direction with no phase difference, that's the pattern. And Analytically, this is the expression. So we're trying to compare what we predict analytically and what we get with the <coughs> finite difference sign domain. So if I put those phase differences, progressive phase shift here with 40 degree, you can expect the tilting of the main beam coming from the finite difference sign domain simulation. That's the pattern that you can get also from the analytical expression. Um, we use a finite difference sign domain for very complicated a uh, tightly coupled dipole antenna. This configuration here, uh, one, two, three. This is five by five element. And you can see the uh, bandwidth improvement here. This took 107 minutes. And the performance on this, for this computation, was 4.4 billion cells per second execution. Uh, when we tried to run this on HFSS, it took days to run uh, to be able to achieve this. Uh, so here is the performance uh, <coughs> in terms of coupling, in terms of the individual S parameters. Um, one linear array, and the reason I'm showing this because you, you can look at the passive S parameter and the active S parameter. In uh, antenna arrays, you can you really need to look also at the passive, uh, at the active S parameter and see if the bandwidth is going to change or not. And you can see a very good comparison with C Samson, uh, HFSS and CST as well. Uh, this is the bandwidth uh, for S parameter using active S parameter, passive S parameter using finite difference on domain, and infinite array configuration. Uh, the papers that address this type of antenna, they couldn't do the actual full simulation. So they simulated one element and used use periodic boundary condition. Although in finite difference sign domain, we simulate the actual number of elements. And you can see a little bit of difference between those different simulations. We also simulated uh, a rocket hit by instant plane wave. And you can see with one time domain simulation, you can uh, you can predict the RCS at different frequencies. In fact, when we ran this simulation, we ended up, we ran it for eight different frequencies. One run gave us all the uh, frequency response like this. Um, this was in this direction, this one. Yeah, this is the RCS in XY plane, and this is the RCS in YZ plane, and this is the uh, RCS and XY plane under different orientation of the incident wave and then the X, uh, YZ plane. Uh, we also managed to put an entire fighter plane into the finite different sign domain simulation and we can also predict the RCS of it due to this plane wave incident and due to another direction of incident plane wave. Um, this simulation and the previous simulation as I recall, didn't take more than four or five minutes on a desktop that has two graphic cards. Uh, I hope I have this information. Yeah. So simulation type 
is about 4.6 minutes for this entire plane. The, the performance is about 6.6 million billion cells per second, and the domain size was 122 million cell. So, um, and you can see the dimensions in terms of wavelengths, 40 by 26 by about 12.5 uh, lambda that we managed to be able to do this simulation using one computer. So the performance of <coughs> the finite difference line domain that we have right now, um, actually in 2018, we ran uh, specs on the performance. On the 2080 graphic card, we can end up with about 4.6 billion cells per second execution. Uh, last year, we used two new graphic cards. At that time, they are not the most uh, <coughs> updating graf graphic card, the most advanced graphic card, but we can reach almost 10 billion, bi billion cells per second execution, and we can perform simulation beyond 600 million cells. And this we can do it in one computer that has two Titan RTX, on one computer that has, on, on a computer that has only one graphic card, we can reach about 5 billion cells per second, and we can simulate up to 400 million cells. Uh, just 400 million cells, just to give you an indication, in this simulation, we had how many? 122 million cells. So, 122 million cells falls here for the aer aeroplane simulation, and we, manage, we can simulate it using uh, even the 2080 series graphic card, or even uh, this green one here, which is a 2080 also graphic card with eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, I don't know how much time do we have, but we can, we can also do the um, speed up using the CPU and MATLAB. Uh, toolbox has better, better toolbox. We can do the speed up using the MATLAB code in the book, using MATLAB toolbox, minimal changes in the code. You can achieve performance going from 10 million cells per second all the way to 40 million cells per second. And that's very easy for any, grad any students to, to, to do it. So we did it on multi-cores. Uh, we have uh, AMD chip that has 32 cores, 16 cores, and with hyper threading we can go up to 32 cores. So we can reach this level here about 27, 28 million cells per second relative to one core, which is about 10 million cells per second. Uh, the same way you can do it on, uh, no, actually the, the CPU has 32 cores. That's why we have hyper threading. We use 64 cores, but you don't get much performance. You get about 50 million cells per second. And using GPU, um, this is what I showed you before. Using one GPU, two GPU, three GPU, four GPU, basically with the parallel processing toolbox, you can be here about 700 million cells per second relative to 10 million cells per second execution on a CPU. Okay, yeah, um, I'm, I'm done already, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, future, future work is basically we are working on cylindrical finite difference line domain, and as I mentioned before, we are using uh, X parameter rather than S parameter right now to include the harmonic in the nonlinear devices. So this is the first edition of the book, and this is the second edition that has at least four different new chapters, including the dispersive material and a different enhancement in some of the chapters. So uh, some of the people who have worked with me over the years for this technique, uh, specifically Dr. Weiser de Mer, he was one of my PhD students and one of my postdoctorate, and now he's an associate professor. Um, questions now? <laughs> Anisotropic 
We have two papers on anisotropic material, but I didn't present anything about them. Uh, if you search under FATAH. From the starting equations, it must be taken into consideration. From the starting equations of Maxwell's equations must be considered. Yeah. Um, you, you, you published two papers. We published at least a paper or two in anisotropic material. Anisotropic yes. Anisotropic materials. With finite difference time domain? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in ACES journal and under my name and another person, his name is Fatah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, all, all you need this presentation for uh, isotropic material. Correct. It can be dispersive or non dispersive. Yeah, right. correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, what, the Doctor, another question? Again. What about the aeroplane? You, know, you, you considered it port two? You know, there is a port one uh, giving a signal, and this is port two receiving a signal, and you are analyzing the electric and magnetic field within the body of the aeroplane? Or uh, in how the is considered? You know? In the aeroplane simulation, we didn't use uh, near field sources. So we didn't use voltage source, we didn't put an antenna on the aeroplane. We were looking at the RCS. For the RCS, you need to excite the, pl the plane by a plane wave. So we were using far zone sources, plane wave hitting the aeroplane, yes. and then we're looking at the scattered field. Oh, as, if, as if it is a target to be uh, uh, of a radar. As yes. a target of a radar. Yeah. With a plane uh, targeted with a plane wave. Yes, uh, basically a radar system is gonna initiate this this plane wave hitting the aeroplane. Yes. And the radar system is gonna receive a scatter signal from the aeroplane, and that's basically the frequency response of the. the this is this is the backward. Uh, this is yes. This is the backward from yeah. the from yeah. the aeroplane. Yeah. It depends on what doctor parameters. Yeah, it depends on the the dimensions and dimension and materials and yeah. <coughs> in this aeroplane, we have a perfect electric conductor for all the red area, and then we have glass for the for this yellow area. Now the question would be, how did I integrate this into the finite difference line domain? Yes. <laughs> and basically, we have the aeroplane. Uh, structure and we integrate it in using, uh, uh, I don't remember, I think STL file that we can integrate in our software, we can integrate images, uh, we can integrate STL files for three-dimensional object, we can integrate DXF files of any planar structure as well. So if you generate a CAD model of a scatterer, we can one of the format of the CAD model, we can integrate it into the finite difference domain. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Artis. We have a for uh, 10 minutes. Okay, and then we'll start there.